I want to uh, go back to something to kind of make this more practical for people, right? Which is what what do people need to be wary of, right? I mean, I think the other question that emerges from a discussion like this for many people is, oh my God, do I need to not eat any fructose, right? This means I can't have any fruit. Uh, you know, tomatoes have fructose in them. By God, I can't have tomatoes, you know. So, so how do we provide some insight to people so that they can figure out how to adjust the dose of something that only is an <laughs> yeah it, it's something that it, by the way is ubiquitous completely ubiquitous uh so if you want to go on a zero fructose diet boy you're going to have a hard time yeah no it's not going to work so how do how do how do people get a sense if they're consuming too much fructose okay so the very first thing i would recommend peter would be to um really try not to drink uh to drink liquids that have a lot of sugar in it so immediately get rid of soft drinks uh, and fruit juices, I would drink minimal because there's a fair amount of fructose in that and it can kind of overwhelm the system. Uh, sports drinks are sort of interesting. Um, some sports drinks ha are relatively low in fructose um, and you know, so maybe they're two to 4% fructose with 4% glucose or 6% glucose. Um, it turns out that when you're exercising- And, and let's explain you, to people what that means, right? So a 6% okay. glucose yeah. drink means there is 60 grams of glucose per liter. Yeah. So soft drinks are like 11%. They have like 6% fructose and 5% glucose. And that really is bad stuff. Yep. Soft drinks should, I think they should be banned. Right. So that's like 110 grams of total sugar per liter. That's- yeah, it gives yeah, you a sense so of how sweet huge, that is. Huge, huge, huge amount of teaspoons and teaspoons, teaspoons. So, um, so soft drinks are really bad. Sports drinks um, were developed uh, originally by Bob Cade and in and, and, and the invention of Gatorade with the, the fact that, um, that people who are exercising a lot are losing salt, uh, lots of salt in their sweat. They're losing, they're burning up glucose. Uh, and some of them were getting hypoglycemic on the fields. And, and sports drinks were, were really meant to help re replenish the electrolytes and to uh, fix the glucose problem and, um, and, and to provide glucose as fuel for the muscle uh, during these heavy exercise bouts because we often use a lot of glucose during exercise. And so um, the original soft drinks uh, were mainly, I mean, excuse me, the original sports drinks were glucose rich um, and had a lot of salt and, uh, and, and water, of course. And, um, and then uh, they, there were some studies that showed that, you, that muscle, uh, the, the oxidation of glucose could be facilitated by having a little bit of fructose in the drink, that the, having a small amount of fructose actually accelerated glucose uptake. Um, and it, it's working in the gut primarily. And, and, and actually your performance was increased by having small amounts of fructose, like one to 2%, maybe 3% fructose. And, um, and the optimal glucose from sports drinks was found to be around five or 6%. Um, now some sports drinks actually have more fructose in it because it tastes better. And so that's a problem, a little bit of a problem. But it, 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 you know, if you're out there exercising, if you're do, using it for what it's meant for, which is a sport, and you're really, uh, you know, I think sports drinks for the most part are, are fine. But if you're drinking sports drinks in front of a TV watching, uh, you know, a movie, and uh, you're drinking a lot of this stuff, it probably is not good. So, um, so but in getting back to other things. Um, I want to go back to the, the uh, juices. Um, yes. if, if I take oranges and I yeah. squeeze them into, you know, I put my little juice squeezer and I yeah. ratchet it down and I just make concentrated orange juice. What is the concentration of glucose and fructose in orange, freshly squeezed orange juice? It's pretty, pretty significant. It's probably about two thirds of a soft drink. Um, if you made it with apple juice, it's e apple juice is so sweet. It's equivalent to a soft drink. Um, and so you can get a lot of sugar with, from uh, juice, unfortunately. So the Pediatric Society a long time ago realized that juice has so much fructose that it was being associated with obesity in children. So they made a, 
uh, recommendations to limit fruit juice to like six ounces or less uh, for uh, adult, I mean, for older children in like four ounces or so for really small children. And I think that that we should even limit it more. And fruit juice is, I think, a, a, a real problem in, in children because of all the sweetness of sugar that's in it. Now, um, natural fruits are different. So natural fruits have like uh, much less fructose uh, because in an individual fruit. When you make fruit juice, it's like multiple fruits that are put in there. So if you ha eat like a orange and it has like six grams of fructose, um, you know, that. So, so Rick, I, that, that, that's news to me. I didn't realize an orange would only have six grams of uh, fructose. That's, that's surprisingly low. I mean, we're talking about a real orange here, not like a little Christmas orange, right? Like a real orange would only have six grams of fructose. I believe it's like six to eight grams. I don't think it's over eight grams. It's closer to six grams, I believe. An equal amount of glucose? Yeah, it has some glucose in it too, for sure. Um, but I think there's about six grams of fructose in an orange. So if that's the case, really outside of someone maybe with NAFLD, you'd have a hard time making the case to not eat an orange. Yeah, I think that natural fruits are fine. Including um, like fake fruits like grapes? I call grapes fake <laughs> well, there fruits. Are, yeah, there, there are certain fruits that have, uh, that are high in sugar. Um, you know, mangoes, uh, uh, figs. Oh my God, they're very, very enriched in fructose. Figs are probably something that we should right. avoid. F figs, dates. Um, oh, dates, yes. You know, mangoes are high. Uh, apples and um, pears, plums, they tend to be fairly high, like around nine, 10 grams. I think oranges are around six grams. Bananas are fairly high glycemic uh, and uh, they have a fair amount of fructose, but it's probably in the range of six to eight grams. I think what we'll do in the show notes is we'll have our team pull together a table of- Yeah, I have a great table. Typical yeah. sizes, because I, I, this is actually yeah, news to me. I would have guessed fruits would have a little bit more, but it'll be good to, to know that. Yeah, no, it's it. most fruits are between, uh, you know, three grams and nine to 10 grams max. Um, and most fruits are around four to six grams. Some fruits have much less sugar, like kiwi, like berries, strawberries, blueberries. They're very healthy. People should be encouraged to eat those. And we actually did a study uh, where we gave, we gave people a low sugar diet where they it was low in refined sugar, low in high fructose corn syrup, um, and uh, but we uh, one group got of uh, natural fruit, and the other group we restricted that too. So it was either a low fructose diet that was low fructose in all aspects. The other was low sugar, low fructose, but you're allowed natural fruits. So that actually was sort of a modest total fructose intake. And when we did that, uh, we found equivalent improvement in metabolic syndrome. Um, and so the, the presence of natural fruit did not block the ability of the, of the low sugar diet to, to reduce um, or to improve metabolic syndrome. So the takeaway here is don't drink it and don't consume added sugar. And I think this is a difficult thing for people to, um, right. to differentiate, right? So added sugar right. is when a food has sucrose, or high fructose corn syrup are typically the most common agents that are added. Right. And it's literally added to the food. So if you have, if you go out and get a jar of pasta sauce, it, they added sugar to it. They, yes, it, it, absolutely. It, that, that's not the sugar that you're seeing from the tomatoes that go into making that. It's the deliberate addition Correct. of sucrose or high fructose corn syrup to make it taste sweeter. And remember that the intestine does act as a shield for up to like five or four to six grams of fructose. So if you eat four or five grams of fructose in a fruit, the, the intestine is going to protect you. In addition, the intestine, you have fiber in a natural fruit and that slows the absorption. So the concentration of fructose that gets to the liver is lower. So there's less ATP depletion. Now, what about dry versus not dry? So if you take um, dried apples, so if you, if you, if yeah. you take the equivalent of apple chips versus apples, but you take equal amounts of the actual calories. So it's just, you know, obviously one is a lot bigger because it's got more water and things in it. What's the difference in how we metabolize that? Yeah, the trouble with dried fruit is that it still has all the fructose, but a lot of the good things are, are 
removed. So that's the problem. Dried fruit is sort of like candy. Um, it's so it's not sugar. just the loss of water that's problematic there? Right, right. And things like vitamin C tends to be low in dried fruit and stuff. So why is that? I, would, I wouldn't, uh, I guess vitamin C is water soluble. Is that why? Maybe that's it. I, I always thought the issue was more that you lose the satiating benefit of the water. Like you can't, it's hard to eat more than two apples in one sitting. It's not hard to eat more than 10 apples worth of apple chips in one sitting. So I really thought it was more, more of just a regulation of volume, of, of quantity. I think it could be amount as well as, um, it's probably the amount you're eating plus it's, you know, I certainly have read that dry, that dried fruits do not contain as much of the good nutrients, but uh, you know, we should probably check this before we um, put it on your show. Um, I, this is something we should uh, fact check. We'll put it in the show notes. We'll, we'll have the show notes. We'll assess that. Yeah. Cause I, I I'm not a hundred percent certain about the vitamin C issue and I would hate to actually be quoted if I'm wrong on that, but, but it, it's been said, Peter, that dried fruits, dried fruits are thought to be primarily uh, devoid of the good components uh, that are in fruit. Um, and we know that there are many other good components in fruit besides uh, fiber. Um, there's uh, potassium and flavanols, and there's a substance called epicatechin that's in a lot of fruit that actually can block some of the effects of fructose. And other things like luteolin and uh, mangosteen and some of these things also seem to block the effects of fructose. So ostol and, um, and different flavanols. So last question I have before we leave at least fructose from this standpoint is we talk about, you know, fructokinase knockouts in the lab. I'm sure most people listening to this, if they're like me, are thinking, two thoughts. One, how do I knock out my fructokinase? And maybe more interestingly, how much polymorphism exists in the fructokinase gene in humans that might account for differences in fructose tolerance? So while I don't think there are too many people born who have no fructokinase and therefore would seem completely immune to the effects of fructose, I would have to believe that there are, there's a distribution uh, across which people exist and where they have higher versus lower natural either quantity or activity of this enzyme. Is that, has that been documented? Well, first off, there is a condition called essential fructoseria. And uh, this is a hereditary condition in which uh, you do not have fructokinase. Right. So you pee all your fructose out. Yeah. Well, you pee about 10% of the fructose you eat goes out through the urine and the rest is metabolized by the glucose enzymes mm. because some of the glucose enzymes can metabolize fructose. Mm. And to date, no one has ever been reported with type two diabetes, uh, with this disease condition. Uh, no one has ever been reported to uh, have obesity. And um, the, the it seems that it's associated with normal lifespan or maybe even prolonged lifespan, but, but certainly with normal lifespan. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm in connection with a small kindred, of, you know, of a family that has this, um, this condition. And interestingly, they, um, they can eat all the sugar they want, but they tend to prefer other kinds of foods. They don't have a taste affinity for sugar. They say they, that they do not prefer I mean, they prefer salty foods. They, they tend to prefer salty foods to sugary foods. Okay. So uh, last question on that then is basically what is the hope for a pharmacologic agent that could block fructokinase as a treatment for obesity, type 2 diabetes, NAFLD? It's a great question. Uh, and uh, first, uh, uh, disclosure, uh, I have a small company. We're trying to develop fructokinase inhibitors uh, for the treatment of metabolic syndrome and, uh, and other uh, conditions associated with fructose. Um, but there are also uh, several large pharma that are actively uh, working on making fructokinase inhibitors. Um, and um, Eli Lilly, for example, is one that's uh, actively trying to make fructokinase inhibitors. Um, and so I think it's, uh, 
it, it's a very exciting future if, if we could develop these inhibitors. Um, and they, they look like they hold great promise. Uh, you know, in animal studies, they can block uh, sh sugar-induced obesity and uh, diabetes and fatty liver. So uh, it, there's a lot of promise with these. Wait, so you, these agents already exist? Because I always thought in animal studies, you were doing it genetically. No, we have uh, developed fructokinase inhibitors in our laboratory, mm. but uh, there's also um, Eli Lilly and Pfizer have made uh, uh, fructokinase inhibitors and uh, Pfizer actually uh, had a success in a phase two trial where it reduced fatty liver pretty significantly and improved insulin resistance. Um, they have another drug that- And so where is that Pfizer drug today? Is it in phase three? Sadly, um, Pfizer had recently stopped progressing with, the, uh, with this despite a positive phase two result. Uh, I'm not sure what the reason was. Um, they have another drug they're developing for fatty liver that um, also had very positive results. Uh, and it may be that they're, they're focusing on one versus the other. Um, but I don't know exactly why Pfizer stopped um, developing their drug. Eli Lilly um, is, I believe, doing phase one trials right now with theirs. Um, so yeah, I, the Pfizer thing is kind of a mystery and you may not want to discuss it at this point since we don't really know. No, I, I love discussing stuff for which we don't know the answer. I'm, oh, I'm okay. totally fine with that. So, so anyway, so yeah, Pfizer just decided to not proceed. And there was no toxicity that you were aware of in the phase two? No, in, in what was reported, it looked very promising.